Round four of the Tata Steel tournament was very exciting and there were several candidates for my game of the day. But in the end, I've gone with the encounter between Wei Yi from China, the 18 year old prodigy, and Gowen Jones from England. Well, he's not 18, he's 30. He's been in the, the England team for many years now. He's already 2640, so a fair bit below the elite players in the Tata Steel tournament. Nevertheless, he is there on merit. He won the Challengers tournament last year. And he has a very good record in open tournaments because he has a, a very sharp opening repertoire. And that's what we are gonna see today because against Wei Yi's D4, he plays the King's Indian. Now this is his regular opening, but we don't see this so often in the top events, probably because, well, black gives away a lot of space and we're gonna see that again in this game. But I think uh, Garwin Jones is absolutely right to stick to his repertoire. You know, he knows it well. And actually these top guys, you know, maybe they don't have so much practice uh, playing against openings like the King's Indian these days. And indeed, a very unclear position arose on the board. So Wei Yi has simply closed the position and he's playing with h3. Um, he's going to try and clamp black on the king side. Bishop g5. Now, what white is doing with this is trying to tempt the pawn to h6. And then that will be something of a target, perhaps for the queen gaining a tempo, perhaps when this pawn advances to g5. Knight a6. So this is all pretty standard and Jones does not want to play h6. That square can actually be very useful for black later on, perhaps with bringing a bishop there. We'll see that in a moment. So queen e8 is a very standard way of getting out of the pin. Um, so the knight can now move. G4. So this king side clamp starts. To, I mean, it can develop into an attack, but it's very positional actually. It's directed against black's big move, f5. So king h8 from going, and well, the idea is just to bring the knight back to g8 makes room for the f pawn, but also perhaps prepares bishop h6 as well, getting rid of that poor bishop. And then the dark squares in the position will be uh, potentially available for black. And here, well, where you thought for some time, uh, um, there are a couple of ways that white can go here. You can either try and hold the position or break the position open. So holding the position, for example, like this, let's put the bishop back and after f5, just play f3. And if the position ever closes on the king side, for example, something like this, then this falls into white's hands because then it's going to be possible to advance on the queen side and use the space there. But this position isn't so clear actually after bishop h6. So I can, because g5 isn't possible because of f4. Um, so I kind of understand why Wei Yi wasn't too happy with that um, and instead went for h4. But now that the game becomes very sharp after f5, you know, whose king is safer here? The moment black's king is fine in the corner but white is going to need to find a home for the king fairly soon. Where he exchanged and played bishop h5. The point of that is just to nudge black's queen to a slightly odd square on d7. And now queen e2, there's no need to exchange yet. And well, I think white would welcome a move like f4, closing the position. And then white can, can, can try and use the space advantage. Knight f6, sensible, bringing the knight back into the game. And now a kind of automatic move and a safe move would be to take on f6 
and Castle Queenside. And you know, I can imagine a lot of players going in for something like this. But actually, white will feel the lack of this dark squared bishop after bishop g7 and the bishop can just nudge around here and claim a very useful diagonal. So I think Wei Yi was absolutely right in just bringing the bishop back here to support the pawn on e4. Pawns traded. So Garwin is looking to get counterplay down the f file. The moment white has good control over the e4 square, so positionally, in some respects, white is doing quite well, but black has dynamic chances here f file and now this knight throws itself into the fray so for example there's a threat to take on f3 and give a check here and well that's a favorable trade of pieces so bishop g2 looks normal just to remove the bishop from any threats here and now I think uh, Garwin's next move is is a misjudgment. I think he should try and just explode the position with c6. Just create as much chaos as possible. Because white still needs to find a decent home for the king. So for example, something like this could happen a3. Now, if the knight goes back, then white is starting to take control. Maybe maybe just rook d1 there. But c takes d5. Now, white is, is winning a pawn here. But actually, black gets a lot of play. And as I said, there is a problem with the king. Where exactly is that going to king? Is the king going to feel safe here? So I think c6 would start to, well, randomise the position. I think that's what black needs. But queen a4, I think, falls into white's hands. And then maybe uh, Garwin overlooked something here. I mean, maybe he was intending to go back. I don't, I'm not sure. But certainly in this end game, white has established positional control. There are no tactics on the f file no taxes on the king side beautiful control over e4 i mean this is a kind of textbook position for white uh, against the king's indian where you know the f5 break just hasn't brought much at all um and now there was there was a further mistake from black i, I mean i think bishop f5 should probably be played uh, but white has a clear positional advantage still have to win this position of course but bishop g4 check is definitely a mistake i mean i can understand what Garwin was trying to do here to generate some pressure on the f3 pawn but he overlooked something here he played bishop f6 but that does not prevent the rook coming to g5. It came there anyway, and this is devastating. Obviously, if that's taken, the h file opens. And, well, bishop g6 is completely impossible. So black would have to play this. I mean, this is obviously winning for white. Beautiful position with those bishops. So after rook g5, bishop g6 was necessary. But this is now just a clear pawn up for white. And I think we're seeing here the problem with playing the King's Indian is that if it goes wrong, oh boy, does it look ugly. You know, against a decent player, there is no way back from this position. Secure blockade. King is beautifully placed now. Pawn up and active rooks as well. Excellent move, knight g5. If bishop takes knight, we can take here. Check. If the rook interposes, well, the rook has to interpose, and then rook e6, followed by that one. 
and that's not very pleasant. So going back here after knight g5, rook f6. That was taken. Everything's still under control. The knight on a beautiful square. King here. That was exchanged on rook g8. So it's looking for counterplay. But Wei Yi's technique was excellent. You know, he didn't fiddle around with moves like rook h2 or, well, I suppose he could have got involved with something like knight takes and then attack rook d pawn. But this is a great move. And Wei Yi played this very, very quickly. Well, he had to play it quickly. <laughs> he, was, he was short of time, but still, he knew exactly what he was doing here. Basically, the king is just going to crawl into the position. Um, and along with the knight, you know, maybe taking here and the king can come in. So let's see, that's roughly what happened. And now knight g5. Rook and pawn endgame is, is completely winning. Then, then the rook would come into the game. For example, like this. And rook h6. And rook e8 was played. Knight comes back to the dream square e4, looking at the d6 pawn. And now the king invades. This is pretty horrific. Um, if that, then take that one and then the, the d pawn's going to go. Whoops. d pawn goes through there. Bishop f8 check. And now simply king takes pawn. I mean, you know, black had alternative defences, but it's quite clear that uh, white is completely winning this. Uh, and Jones was hoping for some kind of uh, discovered check trick here, but well, in fact, Wei Yi handles the finish very well indeed. And now rook g8. So in this position, well, the king has indeed run out of squares. However, this forced exchange sacrifice just finishes the game very quickly and very easily. White dominates completely. That knight controls all the key squares in the position. It's horrible. And after this, the king is dominated. The rook is dominated and it doesn't take much for white to play this and if necessary bring the pawn to the end of the board well in the end that was a very clean victory certainly the the technical phase was very very well played by Wei Yi earlier things weren't quite so clear and I think I think Garwain will be maybe a bit disappointed that he didn't uh, get something more out of that, or at least try to at least make more complications out of the opening. But a very, very interesting game. As I said, this is the problem with the King's Indian when it goes wrong. It looks pretty ugly by the end. Okay, other scores. There were a couple more decisive games. Kramnik beat Svidler very easily, 24 moves after Svidler just collapsed, made, made a terrible miscalculation. Uh, Maxim Matlakov defeated Ho Yi Fan. She's having a rough time. Um, he just outplayed her, basically. The crunch game between Anish Giri and Magnus Carlsen ended in a draw. Uh, Carlsen played the French. And, well, it was very complicated, but things got steered to a draw. Um, Fabiano Caruana will be kicking himself for only drawing against Wesley so he had so many wins um, complicated but still for a player of his caliber he should have put that one away Karyakin, Mamajorov draw, Adiban, Anand draw so that leaves Anand and Giri in the lead on three points Carlson, Kramnik, Mamajorov on two and a half Big Pack on two and at the bottom Hoifan with half and Adiban with one point Crunch Games tomorrow Carlson against Kramnik Jones against Geary and Anand against Wei Yi. Thanks for watching.